Once I started going out and photographing the desert, I discovered that it was a raw stage for looking at the state of the planet. Somehow everything, every cultural component of the world stood out in great relief in the desert. It was almost like a stage where uh, things were illuminated out there. So in this vast desert, uh, American desert, I would see things, um, civilization sort of colliding with the natural world. The cantos basically are a series, using the American desert as a way of looking at issues that face the larger, larger world. It can be environmental issues, political, social, cultural issues. And so I photograph things like uh, man-made floods and fires, space shuttle landings, nuclear test sites. Now I'm photographing the U.S.-Mexico border where I'm photographing passages where people come through and, and die from trying to get into this country um, in the deserts of the U.S. There's a series, one of the desert cantos is uh, called The Pit. It's, it's these mass graves of dead animals that I found in the Nevada desert. I probably made about 450 pictures uh, with the 8x10 camera um, in these pits. And I went to great trouble to make beautiful pictures out of them. So formally, the pictures have to be really strong. They have to be composed right. The light's got to be right. It's all got to come together as a picture. So even though my subject matter is sometimes very much of the, of the news, like the US border maybe, or a nuclear test site, or a bombing range, something like that could be also fodder for journalism, legitimate fodder for journalism. I try to make what I would consider more like in relation to historical paintings, um, like history paintings, using photographs to make images so visual that 30, 40 years from now, uh, people look back and it'll, it'll represent this historical moment. That's been something that's been very interesting to me. Um, the, the shift in time in a photograph. So for example, I photographed the Oakland fire in California uh, over 20 years ago now. When I made the photographs, I decided I didn't want to publish the work at that time, exhibit it, do a book of it. I thought I'd put it away for posterity. What I found is, is that uh, 20 years after the Oakland fire, I did, did a, do a book and I did an exhibition of the work. I blew up the pictures to eight by 10 feet tall. And I found that the work's meaning had shifted over time. It goes from, from sort of journalism to history. Um, and, and I've noticed that with my work of, with Katrina and other kinds of issues that over time, photographs shift their meaning. It's the mysterious opacity of other beings. Really light, airy title. It actually comes from Heidegger, Being in Time. The title comes, The Mysterious Opacity of Other Beings, was originally referring to animals. The fact that human beings really don't comprehend other beings, animals. And I realize we actually don't understand anybody. Aside from ourselves, we have no insight. And I use that concept to frame an unlikely project, which is people just floating in the water. And in Hawaii, I found that people, day after day, year after year, all age groups, would throw themselves over to the ocean and just throw themselves into a floating position. And what's interesting about that, and Heidegger talks about this too, but what, is, what makes a human being you know, special? What is the essence of, of being? And I realized that most people, you know, we, we go day to day and we're doing functional things. We, we feed ourselves, we go to work, we, you know, we do things that have a, a, a practical consequence. But these people floating in the water had no reason, were, it was purposeless. They just needed to do it. And maybe it goes back to the womb or something like that, some primal thing. I don't know, but we don't know. And so I just caught these people one after the other for no reason whatsoever. It's just putting themselves into floating. And I found that on one hand, you feel like you know them. They're like portraits. Um, I consider the work kind of benign surveillance. Um, I'm eight stories up, very far away, almost a half a block away. So people don't know I'm photographing them. And I have a telephoto lens and I see them go into this floating position one after the other. You can't read them, you can't be on the surface of what they look like, what their body gestures are, and you can make out so much there, they still remain opaque. It's not just about the portrait of the person, it's the portrait of the person in relation to the larger sublime of the sea. So you have a small figure sort of floating in a vast sea, and there's a sense of vulnerability. Um, it's both beautiful and a little threatening at the same time. And when I print the photographs for the gallery, they're very large. And so you can see the picture from far away and then move in close and see the beautiful detail of the water. The water is different in every single photograph. 
This series is sort of an extension of an ongoing project called On the Beach. And the first series, which I did between 2002 and 2005, was right after 9-11. I began photographing the same spot with an 8x10 view camera, really old school analog camera. A very different way of working and it was very much in my own mind, it was not for the general public, about 9-11, about this sort of our vulnerability in, in, in nature and in the world. And um, the more recent work, uh, I'm working differently, I'm getting in closer, and it's much more, as I'm getting older and things are changing for me, I'm thinking more about more existential, more metaphysical notions about what it is to be alive and, and our relationship to nature and things like that. So it's been very interesting to use the same spot, you know, this place on the beach that I keep going back to and seeing the world differently as I age the work is kind of slowly shifting, and so the, the newer work is in dialogue with the older work. It's a, and it, for me, it's been fascinating to watch kind of how they talk to each other. You know, there's obviously similarities, a lot of similarities, but then the differences become huge. One of my first big projects was Telegraph 3AM, which is a series of street portraits um, of people that were hippies living on the street in Berkeley in the early 70s. And when the book was done and the work came out, I, I felt uncomfortable. I felt like. I realized then, I was, very, I was a ripe old age of 24 years old, and I realized then that I had a, a, a power over the people that I was photographing that they didn't realize. They were my subjects, and you know, it was theoretically equal, but it really wasn't. I controlled it, I got the final editing, I, I was able to manipulate their world to my needs, and I thought that power imbalance was always, it was always an issue for me, and I pretty much walked away from photographing people for many years until pretty much now. That said, some of my favorite photographs in the history of the medium are people like Walker Evans, his stolen photographs of subway portraits, Diane Arbus, whose work is very controversial at times. I think in some respects she's very much exploited people. On the other hand, she's captured a period of American culture that's phenomenal, that we, don't, we wouldn't know about in any other medium, in any other way. And, and many contemporary photographers, uh, Katie Grant and uh, Jim Goldberg, people like that, I really admire their work, but I have trouble doing that myself. So I'm, I'm, I'm a contradiction. <laughs>